welcome everyone to the last session on the last day, sadly, of uh, Dubai Watch Week, Unidentified Funding Object Navigating Company Buyouts. Um, first of all, just a reminder that in addition to you wonderful folks here in the room, uh, we do uh, have a, a global audience watching via live streaming, so hello to all of you, uh, and uh, welcome. Oops. And uh, to those of you who are watching this uh, displaced in time at some later date, you know, hi to you too. Uh, as we wrap up this horology forum uh, with this final session, absolutely want to offer one more big thank you uh, to the entire Dubai Watch Week team for what has been a marvelous week. And of course, to the Siddiqui family uh, for your warm welcome and hospitality and fantastic organization. Um, uh, there's a famous uh, American physicist uh, who was once asked the definition of genius, and he said brilliance in conception and perfection in execution. And I think that this event, uh, to my uh, way of thinking at least, has been genius. Uh, and uh, thank you. All right, on to our topic. Uh, before introducing our panelists, uh, let's start with you in the audience. Uh, and uh, just a few questions. First of all, uh, how many of you have been uh, involved in an acquisition or major investment where your company, whether you were an employee or an owner or an officer, was acquired or invested in in a substantial way uh, by another company? Show of hands. Okay, keep your hands up. Uh, how many of you found that to be a fantastic experience that exceeded your expectations? Yeah, that's what I thought, so I hope you guys are taking notes, right? So far, so good. Uh, all right, from the other side, how many of you uh, have been part of a company or a, uh, an executive in a company that acquired or made a major investment uh, in another company? Show of hands, great. Uh, and for how many of you uh, did that experience turn out to be a lot better than you expected? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, but uh, other hands went down. Um, so maybe there's something to talk about there. Um, who knows what the following have in common? Uh, Long and Hine, Daniel Roth, Speak Marin, Martin Braun, Roger Dubuis, and Frank Muller. All got taken over and, uh, and the, the founders uh, exited uh, voluntarily or involuntarily, and in most cases didn't get to keep the use of their names. Right, that's the, that's the common thread. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I'll, I'm gonna read some names, and if you think that uh, the name I read is a company that's uh, fully owned by its founders yet today, uh, raise your hand. Uh, Romain Gautier, very good. All right, uh, F.P. Jorn, good. Uh, Dave Bethune, fewer hands, a couple. Uh, Grubel Forsey, okay, yes, okay, good. Uh, Agenor, do we know Agenor, the movement developers? Okay, yeah, the answer is that none of those uh, are actually uh, fully owned by them, and, and you're quite familiar with at least one of those, right? Yeah, uh, none of them, none of them. So, uh, as it turns out, uh, staying completely independent is perhaps harder than it seems. Uh, and uh, as you, by your own evidence, uh, showed with the show of hands earlier, sometimes things work out better than you think and sometimes things work out less well than you think. Uh, and I think that's, we're gonna find that's the case uh, in the watch and, uh, and timepiece industry as well. All right, so is corporate investment a necessity for independent timepiece makers to survive in the future? Uh, if so, uh, do those investments uh, help or could they in fact lead to their downfall? Uh, to make sense of all that, we're joined by three extremely qualified panelists. Uh, to my right, Edward Mylon, CEO and owner in H. Moser and & Company and Haute Lance and member of, you have to, I forgot to ask you, is it MELB or M-E-L-B? Yeah. MELB, okay long-standing family enterprise Melb Holding, uh, which among other things recently took an ownership stake in the Wiederesch family's Agenor. Uh, so uh, that's the one he knows particularly well. Uh, Amr Alotation, uh, board member and former CEO of Music Box Major Rouge, uh, and his family through an investment fund uh, first acquired a significant interest, which led to his becoming a board member and ultimately CEO, uh, and then uh, 
ultimately sold uh, much of that interest uh, to ba Day Bethune, which itself is largely owned by uh, outside investors. And Michel Canu, a uh, legend uh, in this region, chairman of Canu Group, uh, one of the largest, longest running, and importantly for our purposes, independently owned uh, family business groups of companies, a noted business strategist in his own right, and I'm allowed to say this, I think, because it was published the other day in an article, a shareholder in uh, Chappic uh, and Company. And uh, were you an original investor in that business? Uh, no, we came. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, we came in a bit uh, later. I think it was 2018. Uh, 2018. Um, and it's been. Uh, you asked the question whether having invest institutional investors in uh, a uh, independent company, uh, independent watch company, is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think for for us, when we entered in with Chapek, um, most of the people who are there are individuals. There is no uh, institutional investment. And the idea is we want to get people who actually are passionate about watches and care about watches to be the ones who will support and promote the, the watch company. And so far, it's still not to be for us, alhamdulillah, very good. It's a bit of an unusual model, isn't it, that originally it was crowdsourced, uh, and so it was these uh, collectors and passionate individuals, enthusiasts, who provided the initial funding. And now I guess there have been subsequent rounds, one of which or two of which you've participated in. Uh, as an investor. And we even had a new, uh, recently we also had another uh, uh, round in terms of getting um, more uh, diversifying the, the shareholding base with the idea we don't want to have a concentration of anyone running the show. Uh, we want to be able to have people who, are, who love the watch, want to promote the watch, who are, understand uh, the, the business itself and try to be passionate with it. Because the last thing you want to do is have it for dollars and cents. Uh, at the end of the day, that's one way to kill a business very quickly. So I, I did want to ask you, you know, obviously uh, uh, you and, and your, your family business have a, a wide ranging set of investments in industrial and services businesses. Is, is a, a, an artistic or luxury based creative business, is that different in some way? Um, when we invested it, um, I invested it through my own personal family office. So it has nothing to do with the, the business, the, the company. Uh, and it's because I love watches. <laughs> Uh, it's it's uh, a way to enter into a business that I want to enjoy and observe from f afar. I don't want to be in part and parcel of the everyday, day to day business because, you know, um, you give the, we have a lovely saying in Arabic uh, which says, khabbas khubza wa kal nusra, which means let the baker eat, um, bake the bread even if he eats half of it because they understand their business. I want to be part of that world. It's, a, it's an enjoyable world, it's something that's very intriguing very interesting for me in terms of understanding how the, the mindset in terms of uh, going from the uh, orologist himself or herself to all the way to the design, all the way to the marketing. It's, it's a different world than the, forgive me, my type of business is oil and grime and <laughs> very unsexy. So, Making money can be sexy, but we'll come back to that some other time. So that, that's very helpful in terms of understanding your motivation. Uh, Edward, let's come to you. It's uh, 2012. Uh, you're a member of uh, a well-known Valley de Joux family. Your father was uh, head of uh, Audemars Piguet. Uh, there's a family uh, investment business. You have a variety of holdings. Uh, and my fantasy is you wake up one morning and you say, there's this thing called hot lots and I have to buy it. Why in the world did you do that? It's a great question. Um, yeah, going back to 2012, remember uh, was... Um, Difficult time for quite a few brands back then, and, and H. Moser was one of them. We, my father retired in, I think it was 2008 or 2010, and I think his dream, having always worked for somebody else, was to, to own something, to be an entrepreneur. And uh, my brother Bertrand was, I think at that time, in Hong Kong. We had developed a, a small distribution company. We were distributing one brand at that time, which was Oatlands. Oatlands ran into trouble in March 2012. So we saved them for one franc back then. And then, uh, and then suddenly, a lot of people heard about it and came to us as like, oh, if you're interested in, in, in investing in brands, these are the brands that you could acquire and invest in. H. Moser came on the table. Um, at that time, he was about 80 people. He was, I mean, they, we, we, we looked into it. 
honestly, we went and we're like, oh my God, this is, this is a disaster. The financials were, I wouldn't put numbers, you would get scared. Um, it was really bleeding money. Um, it was totally inefficient. But it had great products, it had uh, a network, it had a history, it had an amazing manufacturer. So the previous owner came to us and said, what, we, what, what, what should we do? He was looking for investors and we went to them and we said, listen, um, I think you need to change everything pretty much. He didn't like that, he pretty much kicked us out. Um, I think that was June 2012. Um, <clears throat> he went to many other people for whom it was too small, probably not interesting, too complicated, meaning the big groups, and eventually came back to us and said, well, would you implement what you were talking about? And we said, yeah, but we, we won't do it if we're not part of it. And that's how the, the story started. So I remember sitting with my brother and my father and being like, wow, now we're in front of it. It's much bigger than anything we would have looked at and considered. Uh, we're ready to take the risk. And we felt, Having grown in this industry, having the passion for craftsmanship, for, for traditional watchmaking, having the opportunity to acquire a brand that produces hairsprings, has CNC machines, has watchmaker, has engravers, has beautiful dials. We're like, yeah, once in a lifetime. If we fail, at least we've tried. And that's how we jumped in. And uh, my understanding is that you, you did actually consider uh, launching kind of Greenfield under the Mylan uh, brand and instead chose to... Uh, take on a, a company that had existing infrastructure and strategic assets even though it had problems. Yeah, you're, you're right. I think the, the real dream of, of our father, and it's still there, is to revive the Melon brand. Um, but reviving, starting a brand from, from zero, to be honest, is, I, I, I believe, um, at that time, we believed, is way more difficult than, re than taking over something that is, that is failing, but has something already out there. It was way more difficult than we thought, actually, but uh, back then that was the assumptions we had. And, and you said that as, as you considered uh, getting in, uh, you saw that it was worse than you anticipated. Once you were in, was it even worse or, or you had made, you thought, a, a good assessment and, and the sellers had been open with you? No, because I think we, we were not professional investors. We were like a family passionate who looked at it all like, oh, this is an, an amazing toy. <laughs> and then we looked under the car carpet after uh, three weeks due diligence after we had actually signed the deal. And we were like, oh, my God, this is, this is a disaster. I mean, the, the back orders that we had, for example, they, they, they didn't exist. But we were stupid enough not to go and control that what was in the books was actual... Uh, orders from retailers, but most of them were so old that they had cancelled them. So we faced pretty much no orders in front of us, and that was that was tough. 2013, I think we repaired more watches that we actually produced. And and Amr, you uh, came into into the business of Rouge. Uh, your family invested through an investment fund. Uh, you took on a board position, uh, and. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what you found uh, once you get more, got more deeply involved in the business. Was it better than you expected or worse than you expected? Sure. Thank you. So similar to the story of uh, um, Edward, I mean, um, he knew, you knew a little bit more of what you were getting into. Uh, in my case, it was a little bit different where we, you know, once we were in, we really looked under the hood and it turned out there was a lot of things that were surfacing that we didn't know about. And it was because partly Rouge, you know, was established in 1865 and has been continuously operating. And since then, Rouge acquired several brands. So it came with a lot of baggage, if I may. Um, in addition, uh, the, the business model kept on changing little by little to a point where uh, we kind of lost uh, the identity somewhat. Um, and, and so it was, it was a long process, but luckily we had a great team and we were able to look into it deep. So it was worse than we expected, but I guess that's in most cases how, it's, how it happens. Um, and uh, thankfully, we, we went through uh, an interesting journey. And uh, your background uh, is in supply chain, in industry, yes. and, uh, and rationalization, making businesses run. You're, yeah. you're not a luxury goods guy. Absolutely not. So I, I'm, I haven't spent you know, you know, many years in luxury industry. My background is in supply chain, uh, engineering. So I do enjoy the, um, you know, the, the manufacturing side of the, the business, definitely. It's, it's quite enjoyable. It's interesting. Uh, all the gear and bolts, etc., that you see uh, in, the, in the factory, the, that, that was an interesting part of the business. So I definitely moved from you know, a, a drastically different industry, for sure. 
but then I, I see the parallels when it comes down to um, when it comes down to the manufacturing side, the supply chain, etc. And you don't have to be a 20-year expert in the industry to know the ABC of business, right? So there are a lot of business fundamentals that you can apply uh, uh, across the board, and that's what we were, we were focusing on. You want to ask him a question? No, I mean, um, <laughs> we, we. He said, by the way, he said he's going to give us a difficult time, so we're going to wait. No, 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 no. I'm expecting it. <laughs> no, it's a, it's just a question. I, I remember back in 2012 arriving there as a family of, of watchmakers, but on the German side of Switzerland, and having sometimes a hard time being accepted by some of the people there. So I just wonder, you coming from Saudi Arabia, not in the luxury and watches, going out there in, the, in Saint Croix, where you know, I've been there, and uh, how was it for you, and how was it for, for the people? How did you get accepted by the people there? I mean, you, you, you hit on it exactly where it, where it hurts. I mean, that was, it was definitely an interesting journey, because as an outsider, Coming in, the first thing you, you don't want to do is impose your views and your culture and the way you do things. And uh, as you know, people, especially in the mountains, I have a big admiration for them. They're really, you know, they're really hard workers and you appreciate the craftsmanship and the work that they do. So I guess the, the, way, it was, the way at least I approached it, you know, coincidentally, the way it, it happened was gaining their confidence little by little with small wins, uh, small initiatives, showing that I'm there every day, every morning. Uh, uh, you know, leaving with them, and it, it was really a, a very pleasurable experience at the end, even throughout the difficult time. So I guess it's the small wins and, and trying not to impose your own culture, but rather uh, uh, adapt to their culture and, and manage even in French and speak with them in French in their own language. And, and I think that was that was a big Amor, challenge. For me. Question: Did they make you eat that smelly cheese raclette? <laughs> I'm glad to invite you. It's really good. Oh, no, like, it's, it smells it's, like socks. It's, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Oh dear! Well, now now that we're on onto the topic of, of culture, you're talking about making making incre incremental changes. You know, we think about human factors. How did you manage uh, the the need for retention of key individuals, and simultaneously the importance of perhaps changing out uh, some of the people to bring in those who are more qualified? Did did you take a, a go slow approach to that, or did you move fairly decisively? That's a, that's a difficult one because, you know, the, uh, in the state that we were in, we didn't have the luxury of waiting too long. And, and to me, I guess um, it was one of the lessons that I personally learned. I guess if, if I had more experience coming into it, I probably would have moved even faster than I did. Um, I went a little bit slower because I was trying to be more prudent in my approach. But um, I guess in any business that is challenging and you're going through a restructuring, uh, the faster you can, you, you can do the changes, do it and then work from there. Uh, that would be at least one, one uh, feeling I got uh, as I worked with them. But the thing that I really felt uh, made a difference was, was making sure, again, I go back to this because culture is very, very important. And me coming in, I really was an outsider. I'm coming from Saudi Arabia, you know, I have nothing to do with the watch world, and, and everyone would look at you and say, what's this guy, what, what, what is this guy doing? You know, is, he, is he gonna hang out for a while? Is he gonna have a good time, a holiday, and leave back home, or what's the story? And being committed to what needs to be done and gaining their confidence little by little, I guess, was, was uh, what pays off at the end. And Michelle, you know, your situation is different. You're not, you weren't involved in, in a turnaround, certainly, at Chavik. It's a new, new venture. Uh, what do you see as the strengths of the culture there, or were there elements that uh, you, you felt uh, or feel that uh, could improve? Um, one of the things that attracted me to Chapek is uh, it's a f very much a close-knit family in terms, I don't mean the family members, I mean that they're, the way they interact with one another, you can feel that they, uh, there's a camaraderie that's between them, that they, they feel the pain of, uh, of their, um, uh, when, there's a, when there's pain, they feel it together, when there's uh, joy, they feel it together, and they pass it on. And interacting with the different suppliers, also making them feel that they are part of the, the, the family, which coming from a family business is a natural thing I like to see because at the end of the day um, it's trying to get people uh, on board you can try to force people to do something or you can get them to buy into something and if you're part of a family again I don't mean blood family blood members but if you're part of a family it becomes easier for the buy-in and it's easier to get things done and easier to get to move into things um, some of the ideas that came up uh, were purely in internal, they were not external. They are interacting with the suppliers, they're interacting with the different members of the, of the hierarchy within the uh, organization. 
there's talk back and forth, there's discussions, and it makes it a very appealing business to be in. Um, and we've, from when we came in to what it is now, and hopefully what we'll go get to, um, if it continues with the same mentality, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having, uh, I'm, I see a very bright future for the company. But uh, you having the right leader who is not a autocrat, and coming from this part of the world, that's a very strange thing. Um, but, but having people who buy into things and be part of a, a team effort, and there's no feeling that you know the, the CEO has a right to dictate and or override you. That's not there. I don't get that feeling. Uh, and uh, for, even from the board members, by the way, they're all what you call it, uh, conciliatory and they're all listening to one another with the idea of trying to move the company forward. That, for me, is a very attractive deal. Yeah, and, you know, and, uh, as an American, you know, there, 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 it's statistics that show that America is the most individualistic country on earth by some very large margin, by any measure. Uh, and, uh, you know, your, your culture is, uh, by my understanding, much more collective for the common good. Uh, and uh, does, that, does that play? How, where do the Swiss fall on that? Huh. <laughs> you, you want to get me in trouble, I see. Okay. Um, <laughs> there is a feeling of, at least in the company, there is a feeling of a shared goal. There is a direction that they're all pushing towards. And they all have a part of the, the pie. So therefore, they're all playing the same, playing the same tune. Now, there might be differences in terms of what would be the, the direction to go, i.e., um, go a smidgen to the left or a bit to the uh, north. That might change, but the idea is we're all tending towards one goal and we're all moving towards the same goal. And I, 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 I don't think that's a different culture than what you have in Switzerland. For God's sakes, I, I cannot think. I, I ask my Swiss friends. And if anyone here is Swiss can answer me, how the hell do you have a government that changes every year and have long-term projection? Makes no sense to me. But it does when you think about them all having a go end goal for all. And it's, again, I might be moving in the, uh, a bit to the right or a bit to the left, but at the end of the day, that's where I'm going. And I think that ethos is, is um, within the Swiss mentality. Uh, literally, you're talking about three countries being squashed into one, uh, you have to have that same mentality going forward or else you're going to have three different countries. And, and I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I, I, would I would never wish that for, the, for Switzerland because it's one of the most pleasurable places to go to. It's one of the safest places to go to, outside of Dubai, of course. <laughs> it's one of the most enjoyable places to go to. And more important for me, me personally, I love going to Switzerland because it's like I go to a, it's a kid in a candy store. All the watch companies are there, and I get a chance to go and see all of them. And again, you will see that the, the mindset is, in all these companies, the mindset is always pushing to, I'm, I'm talking about the independent watchmakers. I'm not talking about the large uh, companies. But it's, uh, the goal is towards producing a better product and a more interesting product and a more variant product. but within a certain mindset of each culture within each organization. And uh, Amr, you talked about uh, fitting into the culture uh, when you went to Rouge. Uh, in what ways did you try to influence or uh, mold the culture? Own the culture? Mold the, yeah. mold Ch the culture. Change, oh. change uh, adapt the culture. Okay, so, um, so for, firstly, I, I tried to adapt as much as I can towards the culture that I'm, I'm in, because the company comes with a deep history, well-rooted in saint Croix, which is today, by the way, uh, a UNESCO site for mechanical art. So they have a lot of pride in that area. For me to come and impose anything upon them would be ignorant of me. But uh, more so, um, maybe changing the working culture. Uh, things Because uh, uh, if I'm wrong, correct me, yeah. their business results from this culture were not really great, were they? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so lots of studies show that one third of your, your performance in any company uh, is directly correlated to your culture and how you and, and what kind of culture you create. So, um, you know, I, I came in not knowing much of the market. So, so obviously we needed to have, you know, so, so you need to, so you first start off with different leadership styles, I would imagine, you, in, in, a, in, a, in a, 
in a transition phase, you need to be quite tough at the beginning, um, where you need to do drastic changes to make sure that you uh, have a good foothold in the, in the company. And then you then start to really try to adapt towards a more, a much more inclusive, try to understand from everyone, put all the ideas on the table and try to utilize as much as you can the voices that you have and the, the craftsmen that we have. We, had, we have 40 craftsmen uh, in the company and uh, each one of them come with their legacy, their history, etc. So I guess it's, it's a matter of navigating um, and, and knowing who you are. So you start off by knowing really who do you want to be and who you are as an identity and then work from there. Where do you want to go? How does that culture work to, to take you there? Um, and it was fortunate enough again to, I mean, we went through a long restructuring. We, we had uh, more than, we changed more than 20 people in the company. It's a, for a small sized company, that's a massive change over a course of two years. Uh, and with that, new blood comes in, a new strategy is put in place. Um, you try to um, put forth a culture that's inclusive um, where you know every voice can be heard and then a very clear strategy where you want to go and then from there I guess it, 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 it moves itself and uh, Edward did you have a lot of turnover that you managed through or have you retained a lot of the the original folks I think it when so when we acquired the company there were 75 80 people um, in the first six months unfortunately because of the bleeding we we had to lay off about 40 people we went down to 35 I think um, Fortunately, somebody else had to do that. I came afterwards. Um, today we are about 115 and we have maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 people left from that time. So yeah, we got a, a lot of people. And I think, um, to be honest, it was a drastic change in the beginning. Um, also changing the culture from something where everything was pretty much dis dis decided by one person to something a little bit more we like to call ourselves a 200 years old startup where we try to be fast moving, reactive, bring new products, new ideas. But that took a little bit of time. Even in Swiss, in, in Swiss German or in French, you have you know, the, the way very polite to address people or a more friendly. Uh, you have the two different you. Um, and right away, I tried to change to the more informal to be much closer to the people. There are still people 10 years later that still cannot <laughs> call me like, like this. But again, I think, um, as Amr said, sometimes it takes a, you, you take decisions too, too, too slowly. I realized in the beginning I was scared of losing people, but then we're not the right people. The people that were questioning every decision that we used to say, yeah, but before we did it like, like this, as you said before, it didn't work. So, you know, we need to change something. So either you try, you follow, you trust us, Trust was extremely difficult for me to, to, to gain. I was, I feel, uh, at least maybe it's the self-confidence, but arriving there, obviously, our family acquired this thing. I was coming out of a, of a, of a venture that failed. Um, I was relatively young. They didn't know me. It was, I would say, quite complicated to, to build a trust with, uh, with the people. So it took a little bit of time until we kind of get the machine running. Stupid things like creating one product that was successful that was featured in the local newspaper gave me more trust from the entire team than everything I could have told them and showed them on my resume before. And, and then slowly we, we built, I think, of, I think for us, really what transformed the culture was by starting with the core team. We have Nicholas, my brother here, uh, but we have Maurizio and Rolf who have been working with me for 10 years now. And they were not in those roles at that time. And, and nothing has changed, but we built a team slowly around uh, this core team that I think have, the, as you said, the same vision, the same way of working, that understand what we need to be successful, and that brought the rest of the team together. Now, culture is, is complicated, especially when you, when you grow that fast, and we realize now that when I say we brought the others together, maybe not everybody is, uh, is on board yet, so we have a lot of work right now with coaches, and trying to think how do we really bring a very cohesive um, organization, but it's, it's tough, it's very tough, even though we're still very small with a, a little bit more than 100 people. So we've heard so far a lot of fantastic stuff about what it's like to be the investor or the acquirer and come into one of these situations. Maybe flip it around just uh, for, for a few minutes and think about uh, the small independents. Uh, why is it, if I'm not in a crisis, uh, that I might consider uh, 
taking investment or, or selling uh, you know, some or all of my small independent uh, timepiece making operation uh, to someone, uh, you know, bigger, lots of resources. What, what's, what's the rationale? Should I start? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, we went through difficult times, and it's true that many times we considered bringing new investors in. Why? Because you need, at that time, you need cash. But then when it gets better, I think a lot of the, the entrepreneurs who build something, at some point, you want a little bit of security. I mean, uh, I think Jorn said it. I mean, he's doing extremely well, but still he's, he sold a, a few percent to, to Chanel to secure the future also of the family, of the business. You never know. I think, uh, as people say, you always sell too late. It's usually when it starts going down that you, that you sell. I think it was great for him to say, okay, let's you know, secure the business, cash out a little bit. And, and also, sometimes it's more from a strategic standpoint. Um, you face a situation where you need to move into retail because that's a strategic decision right now. You need to go into retail. You need to start opening boutiques. That costs a lot of money. And sometimes you cannot do it alone or you need strategic partners. And then that's the moment where you say, let's align interest with this partner. Let's get them inside the equity so that we build this thing together. And Michelle, I mean, Chapik again is a little bit unusual in that you have investors who, as part of that community, can provide that additional funding, at least to some extent. Have, have you as a, a board or management team thought about going and finding a big anchor investor to fund any big strategic initiative, or are you just going phase by phase? Uh, no, that's not, that's not even on the cards. Uh, the idea is to keep it, again, within the family. When I say within the family, I mean people who are passionate about watches. They don't want to get um, PEs, VCs, or any of the delightful financial uh, uh, bodies. But to answer your question, because I, I was actually, I, I've been thinking about this question for the longest time, and then it dawned on me. Um, and with no disrespect to a majority of the ones that you have over here, the independent watchmakers over here. And I'm not talking about the size of, uh, of uh, Moja, because that's, it's quite huge, actually. But if you look at the one, two people who do and manufacture watches, most of them have absolutely no financial idea. And they are creative souls and creative minds. And they'll come up with fantastic, excellent new ideas. But you need to finance this. You need to uh, have a, a, a financial background to be able to say, okay, I need to do this in terms of projections. How much is it going to cost me? Uh, do I buy it? Uh, do I buy the material ahead of time, or do I buy it when I need it? They they're not thinking along those lines. They're thinking along the lines of building that beautiful timepiece. So that's why they think, and sadly, um, has been, turned out not to be very good for a lot of them. They think uh, some of these larger investors who come in are going to do that for them. And it hasn't panned out very well for a lot of them. Uh, it's because instead of thinking along the lines of dollar and cents, when you interact with these creative minds, you should be thinking along with them, saying, OK, I know how to handle the financial, administrative, all the other the, the stuff that they don't want to handle. I need to handle this, but not with the idea of turning this into a cash cow. I need to handle it in terms of giving them the opportunity to create new and interesting products. And, and believe me, the, the most challenging and wonderful ideas are going to come up from those indif independent people because they don't have the restrictions that you'd have if you are in a, a large organization. When you have, when you're talking about, by the way, independent, <laughs> Patek Phillips is independent. <laughs> Rolex is independent, AP is independent, but still, they're large. They're, they're privately held. That, to me, that's a different thing. They, they, they have a certain brand image. So therefore, the watches are going to fulfill that line of business, that line. The ones who are one person or five people, something along those lines, they can change their watch tomorrow if, if they can come up with something new and creative. I mean, um, um, what's his name? Um, oh, I'm going to I'm going to screw up his name. Uh, uh, Walter, um, Vianney. Vianney had, had, he, he comes up, he has two completely different watches. The, uh, the one that looks like a submarine and his deep space. They, they have nothing to do with one another. But it's, it's that type of creativity that you want. If, if you want to buy a regular boring watch, I'm sorry, there, there are too many of them. If you want to come up with something interesting, it's going to be those independent watchmakers. By the way, 
I sincerely doubt anyone would have come up with the, um, the color schemes that you would have come up with in, the, in your regular watch uh, manufacturers. It's because you have the ability to do that. Because you can come, you, you are not bound by um, history or tradition. You can come up with some new ideas. Using Vanguard Black. I, I don't know if you're the only one, but you certainly use what you call it very, very, very well. How many watch companies would use that as a color? But it, this is what an independent watch maker brings. And this is what's missing from the larger organizations. So the more we can support, not necessarily financially, I mean, I don't need to, I don't need to make a major buck out of the uh, independent watchmakers, but I need to support them. And if there are opportunities to, to buy into them, to help them and prop them, not thinking of them as a financial cash cow, uh, I'm, I'd be looking at that. It strikes me. Oh, you, no, I just wanted to clarify what I mentioned before um, about strategic investors. I was definitely not looking at PE, but rather I think there's a trend right now of seeing retailers or uh, investing in brands because they need to secure brands. And as I said before, there's this, this move into, uh, into retail that is very important for the brand. So I, th I think we've seen or we heard of many of those investments and we might see more of them with independent brands. Yeah, maybe just to add to what Edward was saying, um, you know, I, I also feel that some of the independent watchmakers who really enjoy their craft, when they come to partner with, with a strategic partner, they, they, they're looking for uh, a really a sparring partner as well. Someone that they can work with to understand the business side of things a little bit more and to take it to, take it to a different level. But um, in saying that, maybe I, if you don't mind, Gary, I have, an, I have a question also maybe for, uh, for Mish'al, because it's interesting when, when you say that you know, it's, it's more of an in, emotional investment, which in many cases could be when you're investing in, in a watch brand, and you have these artisans who are really phenomenal at what they do, and you want to give them their space to work it. From an investment standpoint, how do you look at the return on investment? And maybe even Edward, I mean, you're in, you're in the industry, and you, know, you have your businesses. Maybe you have a thought on that as well. Um, uh, sorry, it's a comp I'm, I would, me personally, I compartmentalize. There are investments that I will do with the purpose of uh, making money because that's the, type, that's the type of business that they're in. And in this case, it's not. It's just a passion that I enjoy. And for me, I want to make sure, if, if I get a chance to invest in these, in these uh, watchmakers, I want to make enough money to cover the costs and a bit some, because at the end of the day, you also want to reward this person who's worked his, I mean, it's his life. It's his or her life. And you don't want to just say what you call, you know, uh, you just continue working for the rest of your life until you die. It doesn't make sense. I want to be able to help invest and uh, reinvest in this person to give him or her the opportunity to come up with new and interesting things. It's, it's not going to be necessarily a financial gain. But I want to make sure that this is something I invest in because I enjoy it and I'm being part um, of a journey. I can't do it. Okay, I can't do it. I can't manufacture the watch. I don't know how to do it. I can't think of it. I, can't, I, I don't have the ability. But if I can see somebody and I can f support that person to help him or her create something interesting that the world would appreciate, then that for me is a reward. But again, financial, I invest in other things. And this one is much more for pleasure. So, so do you write it off in your investment when you come no, to no, the No, 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 no. If I write it off, then pretty much what you call this, this company will cease to exist. You need to, help, you need to look at um, the, this type of people, uh, sorry, these um, independent watchmakers, with the idea of saying, okay, how do I help you get, um, take away the, the back office, the, the things that you really are not interested in? You create a product that then is sellable. It has to be. I mean, if I create something that nobody wants, I mean, my watchmaker comes up with a genius idea, but nobody wants it. I mean, it's a waste of time. But you're saying, I give you the opportunity to go and be more creative while still keeping something that is commercially possible. Yeah, for us, it's maybe we're on the other side. We, for us, of course, it's passion, but it's, it's the investment of our family. If we go bust, then we lose everything. So that's why we put blood and sweat and time in this as much as we can because it's what's financing everything else and we will do everything to make it for the next generations hopefully in, in the family we have quite a few uh, children uh, after uh, my brother and i so that's really for us um, the dream and we think in for every franc we spend in how we spend it the investments on on the other side to secure the business to grow it uh, long term because 
yeah, I mean, we don't have the luxury to make it like uh, just a passion. It has to be a very profitable pa passion. Well, and Ed Edward, it, it, that, it, it's a little different what I hear you saying from a lot of uh, the rationale for business acquisition where, you know, you start with the exit and you work backwards, right? So when people come to me to, for, to ask me to make one of, many, one of my many failed angel investments, right? They always talk about this glorious exit we're going to have and how it's going to be wonderful. You're talking more about legacy. Uh, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, we think for us the exit is, is legacy, that creating something where that generates cash flow that is self-sustainable um, and not, we never, we never, when we acquired, we always thought we have the experience, we have the network, a little bit of no, common knowledge, we can do this. But we were never thinking like one day we'll, we'll sell it. And I'm, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen or whether at some point yeah, there's this opportunity or you realize you're not the right person anymore or there's those crazy challenges and you need to sell it. But for us, it has always been the ambition to create a family business that we didn't have. It was a dream of our father. It's the dream of my brother and I is to have our own family business and maybe one day have a, an empire um, that, that like, like, like you have, but uh, starting small and, I mean, everybody started small and that's how we started and that's the ambition for us. And, you know, we're, we're now in what I'd call a golden age of watchmaking, certainly independent watchmaking, but even the big brands, but you see all the, the young folks who are doing this fantastic work and simultaneously it's a golden age of uh, watch markets uh, where, uh, Demand has outstripped supply. Uh, all boats rise with the tide. Wasn't always that way, right? Mr. Dufour worked for 25 years before he put a single dollar in the bank, uh, and uh, you know, that may, the, the, this kind of golden age may not may not uh, be sustained, right? It may turn again uh, to where uh, the traditional model, where uh, independents couldn't get their volume high enough to get their costs down, and they couldn't get their prices low enough to get their volume up. You know, and, and it never met, that could return. Uh, I mean, can you foresee a time uh, at which taking outside investment is going to be a requirement uh, to, to succeed and to be sustained as an independent uh, watchmaking uh, enterprise? It's more for me, right? <laughs> um, never say no, again. It's once you face a challenge that you take that decision. If suddenly, um, as always, we can finance our ambitions and, and grow as we want, taking the, um, um, how should I say, the calculated risk that we're taking, I think, I think we will be fine. We anticipate, of course, a more difficult market, but we know we're in the same situation we were 10 years ago. I think we constantly, and that's the responsibility of, of the management, is to manage risks. You were talking about our investment in Agenor. Yeah, Agenor is a big, it was a big risk for us. It was a supplier, a strategic supplier that was facing financial uh, problems. We wanted to make sure that they don't go bust because we need them and we want, as you said, I mean, it's, it's not just passion. It's, we want them to be able to focus on creativity, innovation, because we need it. And we identified that as a risk and there are other risks that we, we identified that we're working on. But uh, if one day those risks we need to, 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 um, to mitigate are so big that we need external financing, we, won't take, we will take that decision because what's the most important for us is this, to sustain this business, to make sure it continues, even if at some point we become minority uh, shareholders. I think the most important, I'd rather own a small part of something that, that works than being the owner of a dead company. Yeah, you'd rather have... Uh yeah, part of something than all of nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, and and uh, Amar, you know, let's talk about about selling. Uh, it wasn't your intention to sell Rouge. You were looking for some uh, opportunities to uh, leverage underutilized assets, if I understand it correctly. Yeah, so, so that's partly correct. So we 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 were struggling financially. So as we were going throughout the business, it's not an easy business to be in. Um, but luckily, we were, we were growing, and, and we, we did we did consider opening it up, and we did discuss several times with investors. But the way this this happened with Roj was interesting because part of our um, uh, manufacturing facility, given the, the, the nature of our business, um, we have to have a lot of what we do in house because of the variation in the components that we manufacture. Unlike in the watches, we have different sizes and uh, different designs that come in frequently. So it's, it's kind of an optimization nightmare, if you will, when it comes to, to sourcing the components. And uh, we have our own CNC department, mechanical department, which was underutilized. 
um, and um, Pierre Jacques, a good friend, and, and Denis, they, they, you know, they're, they're neighbors in Saint Croix. Um, and I had a discussion with Pierre Jacques um, to maybe consider buying the, you know, the mechanical department with the CNC machines, where we could subcontract to them directly the percentage of work that we needed, um, and then they can fill in as they're expanding and growing significantly, um, you know, their part. And this was quite earlier on. Um, I think it was in 2021, early 2021. And uh, and so he came back and he said, why don't we, you know, strategic invest in the company? And after nine months of heavy discussions, back and forth, very interesting experience, um, uh, we were, you know, happy to announce a deal which, earlier this year. So, uh, so yeah, it, it came in. So we, from one hand, we did, we were looking for funding, um, but then the way it, it came out was more organically through this discussion with Pierre, and I have a high appreciation to Pierre Denis. I mean, Denis is, is uh, you know, one of the best watchmakers in the world, and in Sainte Croix, so it's his playing field, if you will. And Rouge has been a gem in that area for, for more than 150 years. So, so it, it kind of fit very nicely, um, you know, this, this, this type of acquisition. And uh, again, if I understand correctly, you know, Rouge is uh, culturally, uh, not just an important business in that area, it's culturally important. It's where that, that whole pursuit, you know, Santa Claus is the home. And Absolutely. so you can imagine why a, a business based in, in Santa Claus would be interested in taking a bigger role. Absolutely, yeah. So, in, so, in, so, so you know, pre the radio, you know, the only form of uh, recorded music in history was, was music boxes. And in 1811, the first factory by Antoine Favre was set up in Santa Croix. So it was the birthplace of music boxes. And today, as I mentioned earlier, is the UNESCO site for mechanical art. And um, you have some of the, mo the most renowned uh, automaton makers in that region. Francois Junot, you have uh, Nicolas Cour, you have big names. Uh, and, and, and Denis has a group called Mekart, uh, which, which groups them together uh, and really tries to preserve this heritage of the Swiss um, Confederation, which is, which is a fantastic uh, you know, and, and something to be proud of. I mean, I'm not Swiss, but it's something when you go and see yourself and see the museums there, you really, you know, you feel it's, it's, it's very interesting history that they have. Yeah, I mean, this theme that I, I hear emerging, you know, it's, it's patronage, it's profitable patronage, right? Yeah. Uh, but there is a, a flavor of patronage and supporting the creators, and it's a big motivation that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hearing in all this. We're going to turn it to questions from, uh, from you in just a, a couple of minutes, but I, I can't resist the temptation to ask whether it's based on a success or failure, uh, what's the biggest lesson uh, that you've learned uh, in investing in, uh, in these uh, creative businesses? I could, I could, I could go because I, I would also be interested in hearing from Edward and, and Michelle because it's, it's, uh, it's something that, that really was a big takeaway for me is really how do you decouple the emotional side with the business side, especially in family businesses because in family businesses there are a lot of emotion can, be, can, can flow and, and it can be quite challenging, right? So, 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 so being able to take decisions and being able to compartmentalize your emotional stance towards something um, especially after you know you spend some time working in the business that you it becomes part of your identity a little bit and and removing yourself from that can be a little bit difficult so so I guess that that to me one of the biggest lessons is, is trying to recognize it um, and trying to manage it uh, and really taking that you know zooming out from that emotional and business side of things I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that one because um, my uh, experience so far has been a fantastic experience with Shafik. But you can learn from success as well, you know. Um, it, it was, it, it's interesting to see how uh, there is a collective mindset to push an idea. It's not necessarily a negative thing, as in it's not a... Um, uh, uh, um, when you have an uh, authoritarian body pushing a certain idea and everybody else having to follow it. No, no, it's a lot of buy-in, a lot of discussions. Uh, it takes a long time to get something done, but buy-in uh, because people believe this is the right thing for a company. And it's possible because of this small size. It becomes harder and harder as you become bigger. So um, it's, it's enjoyable to go. Whenever I have a board meeting, it's quite enjoyable because I, I, I know there's not going to be a fight. 
There's not going to be arguments per se. There's going to be difference of opinion. There's going to be a difference in terms of how they manage things. But at the end of the day, all of them are pulling towards one direction, and it's quite enjoyable watching this uh, p uh, play happen. Edward, big, big learning? Um, it's tough. I think uh, it's not going to be very sexy, but for, for, for me, the, the tough lesson was always, um, or has been through the years, that uh, the, the money you spend, you won't have it anymore afterwards. So you have to be extremely careful in every little franc you're spending. And to be honest, we were, we were many times uh, in difficult situation until 2016, I would say, and I, would, <laughs> I don't want to go back there. And many times you feel, oh yeah, that's the right decision, and then you feel like, uh, yeah, there were other decisions. Um, sometimes overconfidence, um, overestimating the market, uh, you, th you feel you need to do some marketing because it's cool, you need to go to those fairs and then you need a bigger boost because it's, it's important and, and that money you don't have anymore to actually create product, make, make it efficiently so you can generate a margin and eventually create something that is profitable that will finance those initiatives. So yeah, don't spend the money until you can afford it. Uh, Edward, if you ever consider a third party, outside party, Who's user friendly and not going to bother you too much? Hey, give me a call. <laughs> Where were you Thank two you. years ago? <laughs> so you're, you're selling Chapek, or Correct. do you want me to buy Chapek? Or? No, no. <laughs> if you if you want, I got, I got that. buy in. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, we have a few minutes left. Uh, a few questions from our esteemed audience members. Apologies, I can't see that well, so if I'm not seeing your hand, just keep waving. Hi, my question is for Edward. Um, being the CEO of a watch brand, uh, do you get to miss wearing other watch brands? Because <laughs> you wouldn't want to be you know, caught, let's say, uh, wearing another watch brand because, for example, is that the same across CEOs in the watch world because the CEO of uh, Coca-Cola would never would be, you know, caught wearing a can of Pepsi or uh, drinking a can of Pepsi or holding a can of Pepsi or or, is this, or the CEO of Mercedes wouldn't want to be caught dead in a BMW. So is it the same thing in the watch world? Do you guys really are watchful of other watch brands that you wear or how does it go in your, your part of the world? Well, I'm very lucky. I'm the CEO of H. Moser. It's the best brand, so... <laughs> no, joking. <laughs> no, jo joke apart, I have... Um, I, uh, no, it's joke after joke. I mean, we create products that we like to wear. I mean, every single watch I want, or most of them, I'm creating because I feel, or we feel, that it's the watch that we would love to have for ourselves. That's, that helps. I mean, being maybe for a brand that makes pure jewelry watches would be maybe more difficult. Um, but we make, I, I think I am the target in a way of H. Moser as a customer. So that's, that's really helpful. At the same time, I have, uh, yeah, I, have, I, I have the chance to have quite a few APs that I like very much. And it's tempting sometimes to wear them, but to be honest, I, I, I don't. Because again, I, I'm part of, I'm the figure of the brand and I wouldn't feel comfortable, even though it could be tempting. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty lucky and happy to wear those. I, I've been staring at that thing for the past 52 minutes, by the way. Yeah, very nice. Other questions? Are you wearing a chap? Yes, I am. Uh, yes, I am. Quite oh. proudly, too. Okay. <laughs> oh, and by the way, um, uh, this is a, a collector's forum, um, and you can tell the difference between collectors and a person who just likes watches. A collector, uh, in my head, I have three different types of watches. Watches you wear every day, watches you wear on special occasions, and watches that will never see the sunlight again. And if you can get the last one, eh, you're good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Up, oh, gentleman in the front. 
Hi, good evening. Um, I have two questions, if you would indulge me. One, just to unpack what, uh, what Amr was talking about in terms of um, how he's dealt with uh, restructuring and change across a pre-existing, very deep culture. And my question to that is, can you unpack that across kind of blue collar, white collar uh, dynamics within uh, Rouge? Uh, was there a big difference? Did you take a different approach uh, to those different stakeholders? Um, the other question is, I, th I think, a more broader question about the industry. We've obviously just come off the COVID run up and down. And there's a lot of, I think, uh, 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 legacy and inertia that's kind of, kind of running through the industry. So, Edward, for example, and Michel, the way you look at your uh, holdings and your brands and your companies, how are you looking at the next five, seven, ten years, given the backdrop of what happened over the last two or three years and that kind of violent run up and what we're experiencing now with a more rationalization in terms of how, how appreciation of watches is coming back to what it originally was, the craftsmanship and all of those things. And how are you positioning your brands and what are you advising your CEOs or yourself uh, to, to do in, in this new environment? Amr, would you let me start on this? Because the last part sure. is, because yes, I'm older and I forget. Oh, no, no, please go ahead. <laughs> we are going through a, a complete change. One, no more free money. Interest rate is going up. The Bitcoin um, money, the easy money, has gone out the window. No more government uh, paying out what you call it because of COVID. So it's killing the most. OK, from a business perspective, it's, it's acceptable. But for me, as a collector, it's an insidious disease, otherwise known as flippers. I hate them. Because they make my watch, it makes it harder for me to get the watch. And two, if I can get the watch, it makes it more expensive for me. I don't like them. I want people who want to buy watches, who buy watches because they love the watches. And I was saying, I'm all for that. But when you start seeing this trend, you, it's a positive for collectors, not necessarily for people who want to make a quick buck out of it. Now, the thing is, uh, for the manufacturers, some manufacturers, and I'm not going to mention the name because one just pops in my head immediately, double their capacity. They double their capacity and they pissed off the customers. So I think they're going to have a lot of their watches in the market in the next two, three years, and you'll be able to access them even today. They tell you you can't, you will. It's those who are trying to be user-friendly, like Moja, for example, who go out of the way to make sure that you can get the watch. It's not we don't want to deliver the watch. We, we want to deliver the watch, but if it's not mechanically made, it's handmade, it takes time. But eventually, we get you the watch. Chapek does that, and I, a, lot of the, a lot of the independent watchmakers here do that. They're trying to get the watch to you on time at a, at a reasonable price. Those are going to ha continue having their loyal customers, and they're going to interest those who are new into this industry, who want to collect and get new names. Those who are trying to abuse the system, and again, sadly, there are some manufacturers who are doing this, they're going to pay for the price. And I'm looking forward to that. I do remember it's on the same topic, and then I'll take the last one. OK, I'll try to be quick. <laughs> we don't have much time. To be honest, I'm, I feel I'm, I'm always very, I have a lot of doubts. I always uh, tend to see the, the negative side or, or foresee difficult times. So I'm always very careful and try to, uh, to anticipate those and, and, and be ready. We've been firefighters at H. Moser for many years, so we think we're ready whatever is happening, but we try to be very careful. We try to secure, look at in very pragmatic way at what are our risks. We try to secure our supply chain and, and be, you know, we're monitoring the sellout extremely carefully. We, we're monitoring the secondary market extremely uh, um, carefully because I think these are key KPIs for us to anticipate what's happening in the market. Because as you said, it's changing. We had the golden years. I think none of us would have even dreamed of having those years. We'd leave them. It might not be the, the same in the future, but the most important is to secure the future in, by managing risks and not being too as you said, Michel, too, um, too optimistic in the, in the future. And, and if you flood the market, you can destroy everything we built over the last years. 
and Amr. Yeah, sure. And, and I guess the question was, um, how do you deal with change in, uh, in Ghuj at different levels? And I guess um, with change will come resistance, that's for sure. So you're definitely going to feel the resistance at different levels. Um, less so on the workshop because it's, it's less so that they will do it directly. It's more on the management side. So I guess um, when it comes down to restructuring uh, on a management level, you need to really make sure, as Edward was saying earlier on, if you're really getting resistant from them, maybe it's the wrong company to be in. Um, and you just need to change the management and have a new team on board that can echo down to the workshop. And making, while making sure that you have clear touch points regularly with uh, um, everyone throughout the organization, walking down into the workshop, speaking with them, getting a sense of things. So having regular intervals of, of discussions on the workshop level and then also having a solid team with you on the management level, I guess, to really drive things is, is what makes a difference. Well, you know, there are a lot of places you can go uh, at different times of the year to hear presentations about watches uh, and uh, how great our new novelty is and all that good stuff. Uh, I think it's only at Dubai Watch Week uh, that they have the, the insight and the courage to put on panels like this, right, where we're talking about things that maybe aren't so visible but are, are critically important uh, to the, the industry uh, we support and the hobby that we love. And uh, I thank each of, of you gentlemen uh, for fantastic uh, dialogue and contributions. And th thanks to all of you for, uh, for coming today. And Gary, thank you.